I'm just going to continue to admit some people now, so I don't have to be too distracted during this talk. Great. So I would ask before we start, I would just ask you guys to think a little bit in terms of this question of purpose, because I think it's been a question since I was young. And I think most of us have, have are confronted by this at some points in our lives where we say, what is life's purpose? And you can't really separate purpose from meaning because as humans, we give meaning to things. We give meaning to everything that comes into our consciousness, into our awareness. We give meaning to try to place it, to try to give ourselves a narrative, right? Our life has a story. It's not just a random series of events. I don't disappear as a personality every day and begin at each new day as a different person. There's a certain continuity of being, right? Of this consciousness, of this I am awareness. And it's not to say that the I am, it never changes in terms of the ego self, perhaps the eternal I am, that is the totality, maybe that never changes. But in the physical realm, in this 3D dimensional universe, we are here to, to grow and sometimes to take steps in directions that don't feel like growth. Sometimes we feel like we're moving backwards. But ultimately, we do realize that in a multidimensional universe, moving in any direction is a form of growth, is a form of expansion. And so as we think about this evolving sense of self and awareness, and we recognize our relationship to our souls, which is to say that which is beyond this physical realm, where we come from, who we are, even where our thoughts come from, which is beyond the physical realm. We have imagination, we have dreams, we see things that are not just in the physical realm, right? There must be that which is beyond the physical realm. And so we start to relate to these things as children, especially we're tuning in. We are, as children, sometimes we can't remember the difference, distinguish between things that we dreamed as children and that which we experienced. Sometimes there's a blurring because reality itself, as we know when we're young, is very fungible. It's very moist and almost dreamlike. But as we evolve and we grow older in consciousness and awareness, we start to solidify and harden into perceptions of self, ownership, identity, relationships, relationships to our work, to our physical needs, our physical objects that give us comfort. And oftentimes as we grow older, we, as you know, we look back at the childhood and despite the traumas and the pains and the sometimes great traumas that may occur in childhood, we still have some level of nostalgia for the innocence, the curiosity, that which Christ speaks of in terms of the inner child, the, the, the relationship to this inner child be like little children. There's a quality that we all search for as we grow through life. We realize maybe we have forgotten something that was there when we were young. Perhaps we are more in the moment, more present, more in tune with our emotional bodies because we had not learned to harden, to create defense mechanisms, to shield, which is really what the ego is designed for. If we think about what is the nature of ego, it's for defense mechanisms. It's for distinctions. It's for creating boundaries, an identity of self separate from another. And there's not only evil. We shouldn't look at ego as something that has to be uh, suppressed or overthrown, but something to be adapted into our greater self, our higher self, our soul's wisdom, right? The distinction between that small self and the greater self. So I say all this to ask really, if you can just listening, Write down a few words that you think of when you think of life's purpose, the meaning, why we are here. How do you perceive this journey that we're all sharing? Because we're all in each other's realities. We're sharing consciousness by the very fact of this interaction. The fact that you can hear me 
already indicates that I am part of your consciousness. I'm part of your reality. We're all sharing in this. So I'm seeing some responses like passion. Passion is a purpose. Experience is a purpose. The pursuit of love and knowledge. Truth is beauty. Beauty is truth. As the great Keats poem says, it's so profound. Truth is beauty and beauty is truth. Sharing life and love, creativity, evolution, learning, karma, love, absolutely. So I, I see this theme, which, which resonates for me, connecting to source. So evolution, 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 to manifest dreams, hope for humanity, networking, inner peace. Exactly, exactly. That's why it always was curious to me when I would think back as a kid, like life had one purpose, you know, is there one purpose to life? Is, how can you boil it all down? And I don't know that you can, I don't think anyone can boil it down to one thing. Because we are in what some people call a prison planet, the physical body, since the days of the ancients understood this, the physical form is a type of limitation, right? It is a type of prison. We can't get out of our skins. I cannot take my consciousness and take over your body and know exactly what it is to be you and to live as your being. I am in, in one sense imprisoned in the physical form. We are all in some levels limited by our physical capacities, right? Our physical needs, desires, uh, wants. And some obviously have tremendous desires and wants and they are never happy, never satisfied. Like the Tibetan Buddhists talk about the hungry ghost, always looking to consume more, to fill more, to try to fill that emptiness of the self, right? They'll never be happy, no matter how many private jets and yachts and ownership and billions of dollars and control over others. And then there are those that are ascetics who are learning to let go of everything and working to let go of all physical possessions. But no matter what, we are still limited by the physical form. So that then creates this tremendous opportunity, as we all know, to grow in our spiritual life, our relationship to, again, that soul that we talked about, that place that is beyond the physical realm. The imagination is a glimpse into it. Our emotional body is a glimpse into it. We don't physically, we might physically have reactions to our emotions. Our heart might pound faster. Our nervous system might get a response. Our body might tighten up. But is the emotion itself a physical thing? Is the emotion of love a physical thing? No, it's something that is that transcends the physical limitation. It's something that we can even sense across the world. We can tune in to someone across the world and, and feel, feel love just at the thought of them, right? So the limitation creates, as someone's saying, creates a way to another path. It creates opportunity. The limitation, just like a, a school or a prison, sometimes that limitation actually allows us to deepen, to go within, to find something that is, again, that transcends because it's not, this world is not about consuming everything that we can, gobbling everything up, taking everything in physical form, because there's always that limitation. Even in an infinite universe, theoretically infinite that we live in, within it, we, we are still limited by time. Which is why, again, I spoke about the, that, that psychology that wants to consume more and take more, and they don't even want to die. They want to go on forever, which is to say, not just physically, spiritually speaking, we never die. Spiritually speaking, we know that our form was, you know, where do we come from before we're born? So we know that we, for wherever we come from, whatever that source may be, likewise, we have somewhere to go energetically afterward. But those that are in obsessed by the, by the physical world and want to consume as much as possible the limit of the physical world, well, of course, they don't even want the bounds of time. They don't even want the bounds of death. So the opportunity of the, of the, the prison experience, the limitation experience, is to what? Is to grow, is to evolve in our feelings, in our emotions, to deepen by this relationship to source that moves through us that we cannot necessarily physically identify. Maybe in moments we glimpse it, in moments we see the miracle, or we see that which defies our logic or understanding of the physical realm. But it is a deepening path, and what some people would call an awakening path, 
you know, what Buddha means is the awakened, right? Christ is the anointed. It is this notion of birthing to a new reality, being reborn essentially to a new dimension, a new domain of spiritual spirituality, which connects us to our feeling body, which really is what we were when we were born into this world before all the limitations of society, all the limitations of our parents and our caretakers and our guardians and all those that we encountered along the way started to tell us that it wasn't enough to just be in the world we had to do. It wasn't enough to feel authentically we had to conform. It wasn't enough to offer our gifts we had to make money for it. We had to find reci reciprocity. So if our gifts weren't validated by people, other people making money off of them, then we felt our gifts were not good enough or we were not good at those things. We start to limit ourselves. So to me, the, the awakening process is actually getting back to our childhood, inner child, that true inner child that lives within us that is always there, that knows so much, because it is not about the mind's knowledge, but the intuition of presence, of seeing that which arrives in the moment where truth lives, truly in the experience of this moment, letting go of those things that we try to hold on to, that we carry with us, that in many ways create that ego sense of self that we are attached to. And again, Ego is not a bad thing. Ego is a protective thing. It's that which does create boundaries. It does give us a sense of responsibility, a sense of consequence, a sense of recognizing where we are growing and where we still want to work at expanding, maybe because we are too closed off, we are too shielded. So toward this end, I want to offer what I would consider 10 things that we are all working on, that we come to this, we incarnate into this limitation planet, this planet of limits, because I cannot be every place at once, right? Even if I can experience 10 million things, there's still a billion more I missed out on. Even if I can, you know, you name it, travel to every country, it doesn't mean I've lived in every country doesn't mean I've lived in every village of every country or every town of every country, every city, right? There's always this limitation. So we can experience so much while we're here and recognize that we are feeling and experiencing and growing in consciousness, but there is a limitation to being here. And again, that limitation is a great uh, opportunity because when we recognize the limitations, we start to realize there's what? There's opportunities of imagination, of deepening into feeling, of deepening into authenticity of this moment rather than every moment that I'm missing out on, right? That fear of missing out concept. Oh, I'm here. So I missed, I missed the gathering uh, over there. I'm here. I missed the opportunity of traveling to that country. No. Limitation is a great opportunity because we, it asks us and invites us to be more present with what is arising now. And toward that end, what are the 10 things that we are here to learn? And obviously there are more than 10, but I wanted to boil it down in a way to 10 things that I believe that we are working at, we are growing through, learning through, because the prison is also the school, depends on how your attitude is, right? If you take the opportunity of, of, of growing your soul and not uh, uh, falling back into ego's anger at the limitation, then we say, okay, we can, we can actually learn from this. So the 10 things that to learn. I'll start with a quote from Osho. If you fall from a hill and your bones are broken, it is the bones of your ego. You were resisting. You didn't allow the valley to help you. The first thing we're here to really learn is to learn how to fall. And it's interesting because we think that when we're children, it's like, it's always about learning to walk. What we're moving towards is walking, right? We wanna stand upright. We wanna be like our parents and what it is to be human is to stand up and walk. 
But along the way, we realize what? We're going to fall. We're going to fall many, many times. And that's not just when we're children. It's all through our lives. Every, every time we fall, out, we fall out of step, we feel clumsy. Maybe we're carrying too much, trying to do too much, trying to be too many places at the same time, right? We fall out of balance. We're dancing and we miss the steps and we fall. Falling becomes an art form. In fact, as some of you know, the, uh, there are many martial arts built around it, like judo. And the idea of learning how to adapt someone's energy to make them tumble, right? I mean, pretty much you play most sports like football. <laughs> you got to learn how to roll, wrestling, boxing. What is it? It's learning how to take a punch, how to, how to get hit, how to know how to hopefully avoid it. But sooner or later, you got to learn how to take the hits. There's no great fighter. There's no great warrior. There's no great uh, athlete. That's never taken hits. It's never fell. And so we think about how life is teaching us this opportunity to become more graceful in how we receive the blows, how we can take the experience and be mindful and present through the fall. It's like if you crash a car, if you're drunk and you're this and your mind is all over the place and you're not present, you're not aware, you're more likely to cause a lot of damage and hurt more than if you're present and you crash with presence and mindfulness, like a race car driver, how you can learn how to crash. The same in life in every aspect of our lives. How we can learn how to be present when we want to shut down, we want to black out, we want to give up, we want to surrender. And there is a time for surrender, and we're going to talk about that. But first, we want to learn how to receive the blows. Because, and someone said, we learn more when we get up and go again. Yeah, but first, learning how to fall so that we don't hurt ourselves. Which is not to say that there won't be pain. But if we don't fall in a way, if we don't learn how to fall in ways that is, becomes more graceful, more resourced in the present, in the awareness that, I'm falling. Okay, let me go with this. Let me make it such that I'm not going to break my bones when I do this, as Osho said. How can I not resist this experience and become more jelloey, more loose, more limber? So that is the point of the fall. And yes, we can talk about getting up and all these other things, but it's not that moment of getting up is the next moment. Moment by moment, can we be aware of I'm falling, surrender into the fall, roll with it, see where it takes you. Because sometimes that fall is an opportunity. As they say, with, with the one door closes, God closes a door, opens another door. Absolutely. Putting you down may be the most important thing in your life at that moment. As someone said to me recently, who had a tremendous life of excess and owning bars and drugs and everything. It took 11 months of solitary confinement to save his life. Now, most of us thankfully don't need that, but that's the point. That's learning to, to fall. That's learning to say, well, I'm going with this. I'm tumbling. Now, in that case, maybe it was only partly his decision to put himself into solitary to force it, that condition, but he learned he was falling in the right way because it was, it was only that kind of fall that was going to actually break him out of a bad pattern or a bad routine. So we all fall. We cannot be afraid of the fall. We have to learn how to go with the fall. When we lose our balance, we lose our focus. When we're just overwhelmed, overpowered, trying too much, can we fall? And that goes to the next point, which is learning how to surrender. 
when we surrender for a lot of people is a very negative word. I know a lot of people that love to fight, never surrender, right? There's a great rock song, never surrender, never surrender. And that's a good model, but it doesn't really work because we have to understand as we talked about the soul, we are here to what? To grow. And if we're going to grow, we have to surrender to that growth. And the growth doesn't always come in the form that we may have been taught as little kids watching movies where the hero fights the bad guy, gets the girl and walks away. But then what? There's still going to be troubles arising. It's not the end of the story. A lot of people, a lot of us have grown up watching narratives of other people's stories, and we think that's the end of the story. A lot of times we just assume, well, yeah, it worked out for him. He's a, you know, he's a success or, you know, he's, or she's, you know, she's where I want to be. That's not the end of the story. There are so many things that are going to come along the way because everyone is in their growth process. Everyone is in their growth path. None of us knows what, every, what anyone else is going through in terms of their internal states, in terms of their consciousness. Even when we speak and we share things and we exchange and we have empathy, we never know exactly that person's journey. So every one of us is going through processes of challenge that oftentimes is beyond our conscious awareness. We're only conscious of what, less than 1% of reality? And that's within our reality. We're only conscious of less than 1% of what's going on. And this is my reality. There's 7 billion plus people on this planet. There's, I don't know, hundreds of billions of living forms on this planet. How much consciousness is going on here at the same time? So it's only ego that assumes we know. I know what's going on. I know everything. That's the ego. I know the right way. I know the best way up this mountain. I know the best way to get to my, to my goals, to my dreams. That's the ego. I would suggest that the source of creation, you want to call it God, you want to call it the creator, the spirit of love that, that connects all of this. I believe that is really the wise one. And our inner wise one, our soul's knowledge is more connected to that. But we must first learn to surrender. And that, if done with faith, is our opening to our greatest power, which is actually emptiness. I think a lot of us have experienced this in those moments where things are taken from us. We lose things that we thought we couldn't handle. We get broken. And we realize we're still here. We realize how powerful it is to feel such failure, such loss, such heartbreak. And yet we're still here because it wasn't any of those things that keeps us here. And we may be here for experiencing them and for loving them and networking, connecting and having, experiencing these, 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 these things along the way. But what we are doesn't begin and end with the people in my life. It doesn't begin and end with the things that I consider my possessions doesn't begin and end with the things that I, I consider my creations, my business, my doings, my money, all these things. This isn't where I begin or end. I began and end a long time before this. Even in my childhood, I was still here before. I will be here after. So to surrender, to really surrender, to the spirit of emptiness, to know that everything will be taken from us. And yet the experience never can be, the feeling never can be. I can lose all my goods, but I still carry what? I still carry the feelings that it brought me, the joy of the people I shared it with, the, the momentary happiness that was maybe brought by these things. The, the feelings of connection that were made along the way, that can't be taken away. 
but everything in the physical realm will be. So we have to learn to surrender. Surrendering, because then only by surrendering does our ego let go of what it thinks it knows best, what it thinks this is the path, this is the plan. And can we surrender to the feeling that no, that force of creation that was wise and powerful enough to give us a world, and not just this world, many worlds, so coherent, so rich, so beautiful, so intelligent with all these creations, all these different beings here, you know, from, from human consciousness all the way down to the tiniest little bacteria, <laughs> the invisible forms, the viruses, all the things that exist that are not uh, necessarily that we even realize in our everyday, most of our everyday life, we're not even cognizant of, all cohering. And the fact that we can actually understand some of these processes, even if we only understand 1% of reality or less, if you understand just a little bit, the fact that it's understandable, it's intelligible. That's a tremendous force. That's the intelligent design concept, that there is an intelligence that is far beyond us, that is working and moving and evolving us. So can we surrender to that force? Can we let go of the ego and realize there's a greater power at work and I give into that. So from learning to surrender, we learn to cry, right? Which is one of the crying is one of the tremendous outlets that we have for our spirit, for our, our emotional health, right? It's so interesting as kids, how, how often we were scared or shamed or made to feel guilty about crying, about being sensitive. Now, not every culture is like this, right? I'm just speaking maybe more of the Western culture, but I've also seen it, you know, in many of modern cultures around the world, this inability, this inability to allow people to cry. I lost sound here. I'm gonna have to write, I'm gonna restart Instagram. Okay. Well, that's why you're good in Zoom and you shouldn't be on Instagram Live. So thank you guys on Zoom for being here. So to continue the, the feeling, as we know, of not getting our way, of having things taken from us, oftentimes we're shamed, you know, grow up as kids, right? Grow up. You got to be a big boy or a big girl. You know, big girls don't cry, all that stuff, right? And it's, it's limitation of our emotional life, which is really one of the places where we don't need the limitation. We're in a physical world that's so limited. Why are we limiting our, our emotional experience? The physical reality is limited enough. Our emotional life should be rich to compensate for how limited our physical reality is. But instead, oftentimes we're taught not to cry. And so we don't allow ourselves to crack that heart open because that's really what's happening when we're crying. We're cracking our heart open. And in that cracking, we feel like our heart's breaking, but it's actually the only way to expand, right? How do you build a muscle? Start to crack it, break it, the blood vessels pulse through it, the muscle grows. The same with the heart, our you know, arguably most powerful muscle, along with the brain. But here is this heart that is so ready to feel more, to expand, to embrace more of the world, and yet we're taught not to cry or we're shamed for, it, or we become feeling guilty about it. We feel like, I don't need to cry, but no, we do. That's how we're gonna grow. That's how we're gonna expand our hearts to take more of the world, to feel more of the world, to show up and be more present to the world. And that really comes to the next point, which is learning how to hate. And now some people will say, well, I, I don't hate anybody. Yeah, that's a terrible word. You know, only love thy neighbor right? But let's be real. <laughs> we all know that we hate. <laughs> we all have our hate, our anger that perhaps is unfully processed or instantaneous develops what? Hatreds. Sometimes that which we don't understand. Sometimes it's, there's a very, it's a very understandable hatred. Sometimes we see someone in, or a behavior that is detestable. 
So how do we learn? How do we learn how to hate? Is the question. Is there ever a right time to hate? You know, there's a great uh, parable from Imam Ali in the Islamic tradition. Imam Ali was uh, one of the companions of Prophet Muhammad, probably his first or second companion, because he was the nephew and he was a very va valiant fighter and warrior in the uh, in the feeling of fighting for God, right? But on a battlefield once, when he was fighting an enemy and he basically had bested the enemy, the man spat at him, knowing he was about to die. And Imam Ali was being spit upon, became enraged and he started to go to kill the man. And then all of a sudden he stopped himself and he realized if I kill this man out of hatred, that's not just. To fight, there are times to fight. We all know this. There's times for conflict. But to take someone's life out of hatred, out of my ego's emotion, out of my ego's hatred of you, that would diminish me. It's no longer necessary. This is just my ego feeling. And how many times have we seen this in our lives growing up? How many times have we felt that you win some, you win a game, but someone then, or you lose the game and someone taunts you? And you hate that person for it. But then if you go and fight them, what, is, what are you feeding? You're only feeding your own ego. There is always a bigger picture of how we are being taught and learning and growing through the adversary, through those that we can't fathom, we can't stand, we hate. But when we look at the bigger picture, we realize, well, Satan, which is actually the meaning of adversary, is Satan. Wow, Satan is so necessary. How can God allow evil in this world? Well, how else are you going to learn? How else are we going to grow? How else are we going to find our compassion, our humility, our ability to surrender? How are we going to find our higher self, in a way, our better self, our better angels, if there is nothing to hate, if everything is pure and perfectly balanced. We have to find it in the other, in the adversaries. And recognizing that there is an aspect of ourselves in them. We all know this. None of us is perfect. None of us has no flaws. To some being or to some other person, we might be a tormentor. There are aspects that they can't stand or they may hate in us. And there are aspects that we hate in others that we recognize we could have in us had we, as Plato always understood or based in Socratic tradition, evil being ignorance. If you were born in that position, might you be that same being that we hate, that you hate? If you were educated or uneducated, if you were ignorant about things, might you be that same being? If you were traumatized the same way that person was, might you become that being? None of us knows what it is, as they say, to walk in someone else's shoes. So how do we learn how to hate? What does that actually mean to learn how to hate? I would say that it means to recognize there are things that we don't like, that there are people that their nature, their way of being, we don't like. But to not take it as an ego challenge, my ego hating you, no. Recognizing that maybe I stand on a different side. I stand in, in my truth and I'm, I stand in my points of my positions and my life experience. And I may stand against what some other people stand for. But can I have enough compassion and awareness on a bigger scale in my higher self that this person or this being is a necessary challenge for my growth and my evolution? A necessary opportunity for me to perhaps become more compassionate because that's really what it is. As much as we hate, and I give some of the you know, some of the work I do is the clearest examples of, of things you could hate, you know, people raping children. But can we see the bigger picture that maybe despite that cruelty and that evil, there is opportunity presented always 
even for the victims, to become greater communicators of this evil, to become those that help educate others, to help overcome trauma, to teach others, right? At the end of every war, there's opportunity to heal trauma and to heal conflict and to then grow from it and teach others. I use my father as an example, as a Vietnam veteran to turn around and say, hey, this is the horror of war. How can I help others understand that? These are the opportunities. And so someone asked, what do you do about the haters? But, you know, as much as possible, we can look to boundaries, right? We create boundaries for our frequency, right? We don't necessarily want to engage with people that we hate, that we can't stand. We obviously, but there are people in our own family sometimes that we can't stand. So what do we do? We have to find that connection. We have to find the place that we can connect to them at what? The heart level, an emotional level, because we all, as humans, have those spaces. There is no evil man that doesn't have family or, or people that love them. You know, as much as they used to say about Hitler and Bin Laden, all these people, I would laugh because I said, well, but the people that love them, they can't be pure evil. They have friends. There are people that love them, that see that, that, are, that have a relationship to them in a different way than you do. Every being that we think, man, this person is unlovable. There's someone there that loves them and they probably just need more. So hopefully with that awareness, we can think about how we are here to create. We are here to create new paradigms. We are here to use the experiences that we have learned, but also more importantly, the imagination of that which can be, that which we were not necessarily taught, that which that which we have never seen. We are here to, to bring it into existence because really there are only two forces that are at work in the universe. And it's not creation and destruction. Creation and destruction are not antithesis. They're not poles. Creation and destruction actually work together. It's inertia that is the end of it. You see, if, if we had a universe or a society where everyone was conformed to the same thought pattern, Everyone was told to think the same way, to be the same way, to do the same things, right? Roboticized. That would really be the antithesis of creation and destruction. Destruction is not an evil word. It's an aspect of the creative process. It sometimes is terrible. Sometimes destruction, of course, can be done in ways that are insensitive, callous, bombing of cities, murdering, these are aspects of destruction that are horrible. But every creative process requires some level of destruction. You take a script, if you're, I'm writing a, a script for a film, for example, how many times do I have to deconstruct that script? As you know, you watch a movie, it's probably the 10th draft, the 20th draft. Things had to be destroyed along the way. Things had to be taken out. And that's just one example of obviously countless forms of creation, whether it's building, right? Tearing at things, tearing at the earth to then get the materials you need to build something. There's always a destructive process to create something new. So really creation and destruction are things that we have to navigate as forces that are at play, but the only opposite of it is inertia, which is actually the absence, it's the abyss. And it's not an evil place either. It's not to say that either is right or wrong. We are in a universe that is at work with creation, but we also come from a place of inertia, the emptiness, the void that birthed before, before it all began, right? In the beginning was the word. What was before that? The stillness, the quiet, the silence. That force is not, it's still in the background. It's still there all around us in many ways. It's there in those that lack curiosity to question. It's there in but it's also there in those that will sit in meditation and silence and have no judgment. So these are the two forces that are really at work and learning to create doesn't mean that we're constantly creating. It also means to learn how to not only work with the destructive powers, right? Of uh, discerning, cutting away, right? Refining, 
that process, but it's also learning to sit with the emptiness, the silence, the quiet, to realize that from the black, from the dark, that's where the light comes from. That's where the life comes from. That's where the creation comes from, the imagination, right? We close our eyes to sleep. And in that, the dreams may come. So learning how to create also then incorporates what? Learning how to care. One of the hardest things to realize is that we cannot care for others by controlling them. And it's such a difficult thing because we all, we want everyone to think like us. We want everyone to agree with us all the time, right? That's the ego. We, we wanna feel validated in our, our thoughts, our work, right? Our deeds, we wanna always feel everyone's on the same page as us. And this goes back really to learning how to hate, learning how to surrender, okay? Can we hold someone with a totally opposite worldview in the realm of the heart? Can we have enough compassion and love to realize that when we truly care about someone or something, we don't have to agree. We can profoundly disagree. We can have very different perspectives. And yet we can find that, again, there is this common space of the human experience, the emotions. I mean, truly learning how to care is going to get us past so much of the world's conflict. So much of our divisions based on, you know, you're a patriot, you know, you're a Democrat, you're a Republican, you're a patriot, uh, you know, you're a traitor, you're a Muslim, you're a Christian, you're a Jew. All these divisions, because we don't care in the right way. We care about things that are, are inconsequential to us. How many people wake up and read paper, read the paper, read things and read stories about other people that have nothing to do with them? Most of the time, we're just gossips. We're, we're interested, we're busybodies. You know, we're, we're interested in uh, what other people are doing, what people are thinking. Does it really matter to me? Am I over-concerned with other people? Am I over, am I, am I dramatizing and fantasizing? Am I creating realities that are not there? Which is not to say that there aren't. Everything, everything is, is, is there in potential. But really, it's my consciousness that matters. And I say that for myself. For you, it's the same. And we are connected in consciousness because we're sharing this conversation. We're connected with every being that comes into our consciousness that exists in a, in a, in a, in a level of you know, frequency on this planet. We are connected in different in different structures. So do I care about all beings on this planet? I care, but I also care with detachment because it's not my job to control. And that's the problem. We have two people trying to control, trying to say this is the way things should be. This is the way they are. This is how it needs to be. And not enough of us saying, can I let go? Can I care with detachment? Can I allow things to arise and fall away? Can I be more present to my journey, my past journey, what I'm here to offer? Because if I'm here to save the world, then that's an ego journey. <laughs> that's basically saying, I no longer trust God. I no longer trust creation, the creator, the source of all love, of all it is. Now I want to be the one that saves it. That's ego. And for me to say that anyone needs to think the way I think or to believe the way I believe or love the way I love, that's all ego. So learning how to care really is caring with attachment and being mindful of what each of us has before us, each of us having our path, that which we are here, we can affect and influence, but not to control. And that really takes us to learning how to share. The most powerful thing about power is empowering others. When we realize that love is a greater motivator than fear. You know, it's like, I've pointed this out before, but you know, Machiavelli would talk about 
better to be feared than loved, right? Think about how foolish that is. Think about what happens to powerful men who can manipulate and rule and use others. The moment they fall from their perceived power, the moment they're vulnerable, they're weak, they're sick, they're older, how many knives come up? But when you're loved, when you're weak and sick, that's when the care comes out. That's when people come to support you, come to help you. You ask and they answer because there's love, because we're sharing. We're sharing wealth by realizing that we don't own money. Money is fluid, it's just a currency. We don't own it. Even the dollars that we transact with, right? $100 bill is a $100 bill. I don't own that $100 bill. So we're here to share, we exchange. And the more that we can empower and exchange, empower by exchanging with others, the more powerful we become, right? The bigger, the more slices there are, the bigger the pie becomes. So true power is really what sharing brings out is, is, is true power. It's the ability to, well, to offer, to give, and not always giving, knowing, knowing what, when we have to receive for ourselves, we have to, as they say, when you're on an airplane, you're a kid, right? You have to put your mask on first before you can help someone else do it. You got to be able to nourish and support and make sure you're resourced. But when you're there, you offer, you share, you give back, it'll empower you. And that gets us to learning how to love, which is not about relationships. <laughs> this is not about teaching you how to be in a better relationship, how to be a better partner, how to be a better friend or lover. The irony of the golden rule is that we're told we should do unto others as we would want done unto ourselves. Think about the problem. How many people are in patterns of trauma of self-loathing, of lack of self-worth, of fear. So now imagine that being that wants to treat others as they treat themselves and how poorly people treat themselves. And then you end up with a world full of traumatized people. You have too many people operating from bad operating systems, faulty operating systems, people that are wounded, that don't have self-love, so they can't give it to others. They don't have self-respect, so they can't give it to others. They're operating from fight or flight. How many economic models and uh, economic and political models are based on the idea, screw him before he screws you. Turn him in before he turns you in. Attack her before she attacks you. So as a result, you have everyone doing unto others as they do unto themselves. Well, shoot, I would turn him in, so he's going to turn me in. Of course he's going to turn me in. That's what I would do to him. So I'll treat him the same way. He, he would rob me, so I should rob him first. Be good to yourself. This is how we love. We love as we love ourselves. Learning to love ourselves. As someone wrote, mentioned with the shadow work, this is the greatest journey that we can have while we're human because as i said before everything is within my consciousness even my experience of you is within my consciousness any one of you including my closest people to me i can only experience within my consciousness i'm not inside their heads i don't know every aspect of their being i can interpret things i might have you know more relative understanding of them but even the conception i have of my own mother and father it's still from my perspective even if I'm seeing it from someone else's perspective, it's still through this lens. So if our lens is blurry, if our lens, the eye is blurry and distorted, if it's seeing things like a, a bad mirror, making everyone fat or skinny or tall or distorted or look like monsters, this lens, if this lens is not clear, how can I see the world accurately? only by finding that self-love, by developing that love for self, that we cleanse our lens and we come to a 
hopefully through that process, a more beautiful reality at the end of it, because we see ourselves as beautiful. And so we see the beauty that surrounds us in others, in our environment, with that deep gratitude and appreciation. So learning how to love is learning how to love myself, not the ego level of my looks, my, you know, my personality, my this, that, that, my money, whatever. No, that's ego. Truly loving the self is going back to that inner child that we are, that just looked out the world with openness and curiosity and wonder and realizes, wow, it's all perfect. Which is not to say that it's not growing and adapting and evolving, but it's all perfect because this is for my growth, my evolution, my adaptation, my becoming closer to, hopefully, who I am, which is not of this world, did not begin here, not, does not end here. Someone wrote that would indicate that we can do anything. In our emotional states, remember, we are expansive. In our emotional and our feeling states, we are expansive. In our physical realms, we are limited. And it's not to say like the limitation is a bad thing, a scary thing, it's okay. Some of the great creation, as you say, comes from limitation, right? We get more creative. You don't, you can't, you know, you don't have uh, $10 million to start your business. Okay, let's get creative. What do I have available to me? Who's available to me? You know, who, who do I want to work with? What are the skills that I, that I want to express and work with, play with, right? Limitation is not a, a negative thing. That's too much of the new age philosophy. The new age philosophy goes wrong where it gets into this good vibes only. Everything is abundant. Everything is this. It's like, no, it's both this and that. There are poles. There are duality. That's okay. The shadows are not evil. The shadows are whatever you perceive them to be. The shadows can appear like monsters. It might, you might just realize it's just an extension of you. So duality creates the opportunity for us to experience contrast. And at the end of the experience of contrast, we find where the connection points are, right? From only from that contrast, you realize that there is a line or there's a border or a place that we share and we connect with, with the other, right? We don't connect with others at every level, but there are certain levels of feeling, of intimacy, of emotion that we can connect with anything. So that takes us to how to breathe, learning how to breathe. This is one of the things that we're here to learn how to do. And it's funny because people think that they're breathing, but then they're walking around with masks on. And I wonder, are you really breathing? Because when we're babies, until we start getting traumatized and whatnot, we're belly breathing. We're just simply letting things in, letting it into our belly very deep, taking these deep, expansive, soothing breaths, calming breaths. And we let them go, we let the air go. We don't hold on to it. We don't try to hold the breath. We don't try to keep it and say, well, the breath is within me, it's mine. I possess it, I own it. Do you imagine? That's what ego is. I'm gonna hold on to this breath. I'm not gonna give it back. No. <sighs> trusting that there'll be more oxygen coming, letting it go, trusting there is more. It's available, it's shared. It's for all of us. Learning how to breathe, learning how to self-soothe and regulate. There's definitely an art form and a practice to it. And we're not going to get into all of that. I recommend uh, my girlfriend's work, Sacred Breath Academy. I recommend Kundalini Yoga, Qigong. There are many art forms, many different uh, ways of tuning in to our breath. Learning how to breathe is essential, but it's also a philosophy, right? Like we talk about Qigong, moving energy. Realizing that matter, materiality does not last, right? Materiality, everything in this, form, in this physical world is decaying. It's all getting older, right? It's all aging. It's all going to ultimately break down. Even the great pyramids, thousands of years, they're still decaying. Will they last forever? No, they will not last forever. But what matters is, again, the feelings the consciousness, the experience, that consciousness that experiences something, feels it, tunes into it, and then 
allows it to work through us. That's the alchemical journey that we take this feeling in, we let it work through us and we let it, we let it go. May it, maybe it lives as a memory, a beautiful memory, a different you know, experience. And as we know, memories can be, even the darkest memories can sometimes be funny. They can sometimes be actually very fulfilling and rewarding. The hardest things that we've gone through, the, the darkest nights, we look back and we go, wow, huh, I did that. I experienced that. I moved through that. It's just breathing because that's all that exists is this moment. Everything else is a dream, a memory, an idea, a place we may go to someday, something we may experience, something we may have, potentialities, pure potentialities. All that exists, all the truth of the universe is in front of us right there at this moment and within us. Because again, everything within is experienced without. As within, so without. How do I mean by that? There's no experience that lacks some level of emotion, some level of feeling. Whether it's, and it's not just the five senses, the five senses may be involved, but there's also an internal experience going on. So we're learning to breathe, we're learning to be present, to realize we can experience this moment, feel it, and let it go. And that takes us to the final lesson thing that we're learning and working on. And again, there's more than 10. I just like to boil it down to these. Learning how to laugh. Let me try to find this Mark Twain quote if I can. <laughs> the human race has one really effective weapon, and that is laughter. Because as I was just saying, Everything that we've gone through, the darkest things, the best, you know, the worst experiences, you know, sometimes they can be more pleasant because you can laugh about it. And the things that you that you love the most and you miss the most, you might still be wanting to hold on to. But if you can learn to laugh, this is our weapon. This is why in the Shakespearean canon, I believe the last or one of the last plays, at least, is called The Winter's Tale. And it starts, the first half of it is a tragedy, right? It's a tragic story. Don't remember the details. So I just remember the experience of like how heavy it is. But by the second act, it becomes a comedy. Because essentially in the wisdom of the Shakespearean canon, I'm not going to say who wrote Shakespeare at this point, because I certainly not William. But the point is that the canon, the wisdom of it is telling you that the tragedy becomes comedy. The divine comedy as Dante talked about it. When you get to that point of realizing I got, when I thought while I was going down, I was actually journeying to something that was a new discovery that I just didn't realize. You know, it's like going deep into the earth to realize the gold isn't in, is in there, right? It's dark in there. It's dark and the diamonds are in there. The gold is in there. It's in those dark places, right? Those places you don't want to go to that scare you. That's where the treasure is. So learning how to laugh, it's like this cosmic joke of how can we be in the universe? How can we be in a, a, in a world where all these things can exist? There are flying saucers and there's hot dogs. There's, there's, there's literally, I mean, there's, there's war and pestilence and there's clowns. I mean, there's such range of diversity of being in this, in, in these dimensions and beyond this, you know, the physical dimension that we start to experience when we recognize again, that this is not the be all end all, right? The three-dimensional reality is not the be all end all, but laughing, learning how to laugh, learning how not to take things too seriously, learning to detach to the place where we can be amused and not bypassed, not to bypass either, because there is a time and a place for tears. There's a time and a place we talked about to cry, to feel things. You know, if you feel uncomfortable, you feel it. But when we look back on things and we look at the bigger picture, there is laughter. There is this great cosmic joke that God put our sex organs next to our excrement organs. There's this great cosmic joke that uh, we are, you know, we are here as these little, you know, as these little beings that think, you know, that think so much of themselves and know so little. We are here for this very short period of time to discover as much as we can, but really we're making it up as we go along. Every moment we don't have, we're not sitting here reading our guidebook or manual every moment saying, okay, it's time to do this now. Okay. Directions, directions for today. What do I do today? We're making it up. 
there's a tremendous spirit of humor that underlies this whole existence. And I think that if we would, if we really are honest with ourselves and we get to that place where we go through the emotion, we feel it, we feel the heartbreak, we feel the sorrow, we feel the pains. And we really just look at it and we go, man, but nothing, none of this lasts in this domain. It doesn't last anyway. We have to laugh. We have to realize that it is divine comedy, that there is a cleansing, that all things have to go through the portal of death, right? That transition. And in the face of it, there's only two things to do, to scream or to laugh, and sometimes both. So with that, I just want to invite you all to uh, subscribe to my seanstone.info, my website. I actually am going to be offering a, uh, a new workshop, four-part workshop called The Art of Success. And um, this will, you know, hopefully you guys enjoy this, this little conversation here. I love, um, maybe I'll just like any, any more comments or, or questions you guys want to put into the chat. Um, I know people have to get going and we're going to wrap up here. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and put, where can I put this? Uh, in the Zoom link, I'm going to go ahead and put a link to our offering. And we'll also be emailing this out, guys. So I'm just typing it here. If you guys want to go ahead and you can go to the, uh, the, the link for the four-part workshops. I put the link in the Zoom. And um, for the Instagram Live, thank you guys for joining. Please help you subscribe and stay tuned for the workshop coming up. Hope to see you there. Thank you. All right. Uh, there we go, guys. Thank you all for joining today. Really appreciate you coming. And hopefully, hopefully you got something out of this conversation or uh, not really conversation, a little bit of a monologue, but uh, hopefully you feel that you got what you came for. Um, anyone? Yeah, people are asking, how can you watch from the beginning? We will have a link coming up. Don't worry if you signed up for the emails, stay tuned for that link and also for the upcoming uh, workshop link. And anyone has any uh, questions or comments in the chat, I'm going to go ahead and leave this open for a couple minutes here. Uh, but again, thank you all for, uh, for being a part of it. I think we got like almost 40 people here, which was wonderful to see everyone. And uh, let's see. All right. Where is our chat? more than I expected. All right, beautiful. Well, again, thank you guys. Thank you all for joining. Um, and stay tuned to your emails. Please, please pay attention to your emails. And uh, if you want to do the workshop, I'd love to see you there. Thank you again. I hope you have a beautiful day.